Hey guys, and welcome to another video in my Shadows Over Innistrad limited review series. So far we have covered the best commons and uncommons in each color, and now we move more generally to all the colors to talk about what the top 10 rares and mythics are in the format. In other words, what rare or mythic would you most like to open in your first pack, um, because it's just that powerful that it'll have a huge impact on how you draft. I will say before we get started on this list that this format does not seem like one that will regularly be dictated by the power of rares. There are powerful rares and powerful mythics, of course, but this is not a set where, you know, the majority of rares and mythics are the number one pick you should take out of a pack or anything like that. Um, there are several uncommons in this set that I would take before most of the rares, um, and this is one of them. Um, and the way I sort of came up with uh, how I would pick the top 10 uh, mythics and rares was to think, would I take it before taking Duskwatch Recruiter here, uh, or Bound by Moonsilver, the white card that is, I think, also a candidate to be the best uncommon in the set. Um, that's two and a white that and locks down a creature, makes it so it can't attack or block or transform, and you can actually move it around by sacrificing permanence. Those two uncommons are very strong, stronger than the majority of rares in the format. Um, and so what I did was think, would I take this rare before either Duskwatch Recruiter or Bound by Moonsilver? Um, and that's how I came up with this list. I do have one honorable mention because I feel like her absence from the list will make people think I'm crazy or something because she's a planeswalker. But I have to say, I would actually take either of the uncommons I just mentioned, and a few others, especially if they're removal, over Nihiri the Harbinger in a vacuum in a world where she's not worth anything, of course, but she's a mythic, so she will be. And that's because I'm not overly like impressed by Nihiri in Limited, at least. Um, for four mana, you know, you like, four mana for a Planeswalker is usually very good, but her abilities just aren't that great to me. Um, her ability to draw you a card, if you discard a card, can be good if you have a lot of cards with Madness, but if you don't have cards with Madness, it gets a lot worse. Um, you're going to have a few probably if you're in red, of course, but still, there are definitely situations where that ability is not good. And the limitation placed on her removal, her only way of protecting herself is by removing a creature, is too great. Um, she can exile enchantments, tapped artifacts, or tapped creatures. Her only being able to exile tapped creatures makes her pretty bad. And her ultimate is pretty good, but again, in limited, it's actually not that good. You need to have some crazy bomb in your deck to make her her uh, unlimited really, really good. Um, otherwise, it's really kind of, you know, not that great. You get to attack with it, and then it goes back to your hand even. It doesn't even stay in play. So she's kind of an underwhelming Planeswalker in limited. She might show up in constructed. Um, she didn't make it on my list of the top 10 cards I think would I would see in constructed, but she does have really cool art, so at least she has that going for her. But I just wanted to say that I don't consider her to be one of these top 10 rares or mythics, but that I should discuss with you why, because I see can see a lot of people being questioning why I wouldn't have a Planeswalker on the list. So anyway, on to the list itself. At number 10, I have from under the floorboards. Um, this card is very strong. I would take it over you know, all the uncommons in the set, basically, since I said I'd take it over the two strongest, and I'll tell you why. Um, its fail case is five mana for three bodies and three life. Um, that's pretty relevant. Five mana for six power and three life is great. Then, if you end up in a deck that can trigger the Madness, it gets even more ridiculous. Don't forget, with Madness, you can do things at instant speed. Um, so you could use, you could discard your From Under the Floorboards into your opponent's turn, get yourself a lot more zombies and a lot more life if you have the mana. But even if you're just doing it for four or five or something like that, it's going to make a huge impact on the game. It's going to be incredibly strong. Um, and uh, I think from under the floorboards, even in a deck where you can't activate Madness, is a strong card just because it gives you a certain degree of card advantage over an opponent. And it's good at any stage of the game. If you're curving out and playing it on turn five, you're pretty happy. But if you top deck this when your opponent is, you know, about to kill you, you're also pretty happy because it both gains you life and gives you a way to slow their attack. So from under the floorboards is number 10 for me. From there, we move on to number nine, which is where I have Drog Skull Cavalry. All the other cards on this list get to have art behind them. But for some reason, for some reason, I couldn't find Drog Skull Cavalry's art online, uh, you know, in a high definition picture or, you know, or anything like that, so it just gets a black background. And I apologize, because Drog Skull Cavalry is actually quite strong. It's 7 mana for a 4-4 four, four flyer, so yes, it fails a vanilla test. But, uh, well, the second part also doesn't isn't what puts it over. But whenever you play any other spirit, you gain 2 life. Going to be okay, a good card in the blue-white spirit deck. But it's playable in any white deck, because it can also churn out spirits all on its own. So basically, if you're allowed to untap with your Drog Skull Cavalry in play, it's going to be pretty hard to lose, especially if you get a turn or two being able to crank out spirits and gain life. 
Plus, it's a threat in the air. So Drag Skull Cavalry is number nine for me. Very strong. Good in any deck, but especially in the Blue-White Spirit deck. At number eight, we do have a Planeswalker. And it's Jace, Unraveler of Secrets. Um, Jace, also not an overwhelmingly powerful Planeswalker, but I think he's better than Nahiri. And I'll tell you why. First of all, he's one color. <laughs> so you don't really want to be first picking Nahiri, who's two colors very often, especially because... Red-white, uh, in my estimation, as you'll see in my archetype uh, overview, is basically the weakest archetype in the format. Jace, um, on the other hand, is blue, and he's mono-blue. He does cost double blue, so you can't really splash him. But that is something that makes him significantly better to take first and makes him significantly stronger because he's easier to cast. Plus, his draw card ability is far better. Um, he lets you scry and draw cards. So you get to look at two cards, potentially. Drawing cards could be what helps you protect Jace, but he can also protect himself to a degree by bouncing your opponent's creatures. Um, and I think he's strong enough because if you play him and you have a whole, you know, you have a couple creatures in play already and your opponent can't get to Jace, you're just going to win the game on card advantage and card selection and bouncing things when you need to. And his emblem, if you get there, is also obviously very strong and limited, especially once you and your opponent are both in top deck mode. It's really going to hurt your opponent. Um, so Jace, Unraveler of Secrets, uh, number eight for me out of the top ten Mythics and Rares in the format. At number seven, we have Flameblade Angel, six mana for a 4-4 four, four flyer. Already passes the vanilla test. But on top of that, it has whenever a source an opponent controls deals damage to you or a permanent you control, you may have Flameblade Angel deal one damage to that source's controller. So one damage doesn't sound like a lot, right? But this is going to create absolute havoc on the board, and it's going to be havoc in your favor. You can be swinging. If your opponent is anywhere, you know, around 10 life, and you're swinging with your board at them, and they can't deal with your Flameblade Angel, even just blocking your creatures that, by the way, still end up killing their creature, you know, they're not even trading, they're chump blocking, does one damage to them because their creature did damage to your creature. Um, additionally, if you're the one who's behind a little bit, Playing your Flameblade Angels of 4-4 is great, and your opponent hurting themselves when they hurt you can get you back in the game. Obviously, this is a card that's at its best probably when you're sort of at parity because it'll just break through that, and when you're ahead, it'll also just basically end the game. But Flameblade Angel is really strong just because of the amount of chaos it creates. It's going to make your opponent have to play a completely different game unless you know they're at 20 and you're at 2 or something. Then it's probably too late, but even then, she might be able to pull you out of it. But Flameblade Angel, a very strong, uh, rare, and one I would happily take in my first pack. On to number six, I have Relentless Dead. Um, he's a little small as far as powerful mythics and rares go, but what he can do is pretty ridiculous. Um, he does cost double black, so if you're taking him, you want to have a deck that has a decent number of swamps, of course. But he has, he's a 2-2 with Menace, you know, you're happy with that. But every time he dies, you can play, pay one black and get him back to your hand. Not only that, if you end up in a deck that has other zombies in it, you can return other zombies from your graveyard. And remember, you can use both of those abilities if you have the mana to do so. You can use Both of them are separate triggers, so when he dies, you can pay one black to return him to your hand, and pay two black to return a two-mana zombie from your graveyard to the battlefield, directly to the battlefield. So this guy is a huge problem for your opponent no matter when you play it. If you play it early... Your opponent's obviously really scared because they, you have a 2-mana, two 2-2 two, two menace. going to be hard for them to stop early, and they really don't even want to trade with this guy ever at any point in the game because they're not getting much value out of it. Um, on top of that, and if you play it in a later part of the game, it's an infinite chump blocker who, if you have other zombie synergies, can get other zombies back. Even without those zombie ch synergies, though, this card is strong because, again, it's not a card your opponent's going to want to trade with, and it's one that can, has an evasive ability and is efficient for its cost. But obviously, it is going to be at its best in a zombie deck. And if you're taking this guy first, I'd recommend trying to see if the zombie deck is open. Because then he just gets completely ridiculous if every time he dies, he's also bringing other cards back from your graveyard. Basically, your opponent will just stop attacking you altogether if you have those synergies going on. And that's kind of what you want to happen uh, if you want to win the game. So that's number six for me, Relentless Dead. Probably also going to be worth a lot of tickets, if I had to guess. Uh, or dollars, depending on whether you draft online or in, uh, in real life. So on to number five, I have Tireless Tracker, the first appearance of a green card on the list. Uh, three mana for a 3-2. Passes the vanilla test, but also has a landfall ability. It doesn't say landfall, but, you know, it's a landfall ability. Uh, whenever any land enters the battlefield, you get a clue, and then every time you sacrifice a clue, uh, Tireless Tracker gets bigger. So basically, Tireless Tracker, what's great about it is, on its own, it's an engine. Um, 
it creates something that helps you draw a card every time you play a land. You do have to pay two to sacrifice that. And every time you sacrifice the clue it gives you, it gets bigger. It's obviously going to get even stronger in a deck that has a lot of other clue thing, things to, to make clues in it, which the blue-green deck seems the most primed to do. But even on its own, it's a ridiculous engine. You'd be happy to first pick this, play it in any green deck you get, because if your opponent doesn't deal with it quickly, it's going to get out of control, and it replaces itself pretty quickly, especially if you wait till you know, turn four and you play it and then a land, you have it's basically paid for itself. Maybe not quite since you don't have to pay two more mana to draw the card, but it's not a horrible investment and he gets to be a huge problem if your opponent can't deal with it. He'll basically be a magnet, or she rather, will be a, a magnet for removal in the early game. And in the late game, it can help you draw into what you need. Um, and that's, you know, the exact kind of cards you want. At number four, we have another Planeswalker and it's a gold one. But it's so strong that I would happily first pick this and try my hardest to be in these colors um, because he's that good. He's a six mana planeswalker, but he also comes with six loyalty, which means he's a little harder to kill than most. Um, but what's amazing about him is that you can draw cards with him. That's something that a lot of planeswalkers can do, right? Jace does it. But Soren draws you a card, and on top of that, if that card has a converted mana cost of any kind, your opponent loses life equal to it. So basically, if it's not a land, they're going to lose some life can be a, quite a lot of life, depending on what kind of deck you have. And obviously, Soren's probably going to be best served in a control deck where you can sort of protect him with removal and things like that. But even if you can't, he's, if you're paying six to do six damage to a creature and gain six life, just think of Soren like that, that's a pretty good deal. That's a pretty hard race. That's pretty hard for your opponent to recover from because you probably just killed their best creature and gained six life in the process. Um, and if you're paying six to do five and then you keep Soren, that's great too. Um, his ultimate's actually not that great, um, but <laughs> his plus one and his minus X are so good that they're, you know, that it, it, that's basically what makes him make this list. I mean, his ultimate can be good, um, but, you know, most games you're not going to have a ton of life, and neither is your opponent by the time you play Soren, but it could happen. He does help you gain life, after all, uh, but that's also a minus X ability, so you're not going to have, get to nine counters very easily after you use it. But still, Soren, very strong Planeswalker, but... He's not the number one Planeswalker on this list. Number one Planeswalker I have is Arlen Kord. Um, she is red-green. Um, and I think red-green is one of the stronger archetypes, one of the more well-supported archetypes in the format. Again, I'll be talking about more about these archetypes uh, in the last video in my series, which will be out in a couple days on... Uh, the archetypes, but I think red green is one of the stronger ones. So that already gives Arlen Kord a leg up. On top of that, she's just really good. Um, she's a four mana planeswalker. She does only have three loyalty, which makes her weak, but she comes with not only one, but two abilities that help her protect herself. She can make a wolf token that helps protect you uh, and herself. And she can also just pump up one of your creatures so it hits harder, but also give it vigilance so it can stay back and protect you if it needs to. Um, on top of that, she can transform. If you use her wolf ability, she will. You won't really have a choice. And once there, she gets a, you know, a mini overrun ability, giving your whole team plus one, plus one, and trample. Um, or she can lightning bolt things, which causes her to transform back into her other form. And she can also give you a pretty strong emblem. But again, you know, her ultimate's not game-breaking or anything. Um, but it's pretty good. It gives creatures you control haste, and they can, you know, use sort of a fight effect tap to do damage equal to its power to a creature or player so pretty strong you do have to have creatures to make it work um but she does give you wolves in the meantime um one of the you know ideal things to do is play her for four make a wolf token flipper uh and then the next turn use her ability to do three damage to something she turns back use her plus one then use her wolf ability again you can kind of cycle between making wolves pumping people pumping your guys because she doesn't have to make a wolf every turn to protect you she can just pump a wolf she already made in some cases. And then going back and lightning bolting and going back and forth. And sometimes if you're going wide, you'll also just use her plus one and it'll just end the game right there. So Arlen Kord, the strongest of the Planeswalkers uh, uh, that were printed in Shadows Over Innistrad, at least for limited purposes. Um, and I would be happy to take her first. It does mean you have to, you know, red green has to be open to make her work. And hopefully it is if you take her because she's pretty sweet. You should try as hard as you can to make it work if you take her maybe even picking up some fixing to make it work. But so that's my number three. She'd probably be even higher if she weren't two colors, but she is, alas. So on to number two, which is where I have Descend Upon the Sinful. It is the only like board wiper in the format. Um, and it deals with creatures with hexproof. It deals with creatures with indestructible. It deals with everything. 
because they get exiled, which also means it's not going to help your opponent's delirium in any way. It won't help creatures have death triggers, which is, a, you know, creatures have those. It won't help your, any of that happen. It is symmetrical, so it's going to hit your creatures. But the thing is, if you're playing, if you first pick Descend Upon a Sinful, you're building a control deck. And even if you end up not being able to build a control deck, when you know you have this in your deck or in your hand, you can play differently, get your opponent to overcommit, and just play this and destroy the board. It's the only board wiper in the format, like I said, and it's mythic. So your opponent's really not going to be expecting it at all uh, most of the time. I mean, if you play it in game one, they'll expect it in game two and play a little differently. Um, but on top of that, it has delirium. If it wasn't already good enough, you know, board sw sweepers are always pretty good, even at six, because they just completely destroy the game and make things usually go in your favor. This really makes it go in your, make sure it goes in your favor if you have delirium, which isn't that hard to obtain. Um, but, you know, it can potentially be difficult, uh, but it's good even if you can't cast a delirium. But if you have delirium, which means, I uh, realize the reminder text isn't there, that you have cards with at least four different types in your graveyard, um, you also get a 4-4 four, four white angel creature token. So it nukes your opponent's board while giving you something, which makes it even more ridiculous. So to send upon the fit sinful is number two for me. Um, I, you know, every time I open that in first pack, I'll take it. Um, and there's not much else to that. There is, however, a number one, a card that I think is actually better than Descend Upon the Sinful, and that is Archangel Avacyn. So probably not a big surprise since at least after you saw numbers two and three, you're probably like, well, Avacyn's probably, you know, above both of these. And she is. Um, she's ridiculous because she's a five mana, four, four, flying and vigilance. So Sarah Angel, a card that was very good in its own day. But on top of that, um, she also has Flash, you know, throw that in there so you can fly her in and have her kill an opponent's creature. And guess what? By the way... She's not going to die in the process either, because even if it would have been a trade, because she gives all your creatures indestructible until end of turn. So you can declare all sorts of crazy blocks to deal with your opponent's alpha strike and then play Avacyn. You can play her in response to removal. You can play her in response to a lot of things. You can just flash her in if you have to, if you just want to start beating down on your opponent. Um, and that's just incredible. On top of that, uh, if that wasn't enough, she can transform if one of your creatures dies who isn't an angel. Um, and she turns into Avacyn the Purifier, which does three damage to each other creature and each opponent. This, sometimes you're not going to want her to transform, especially if you're a more aggressive deck. Avacyn fits into any white deck, obviously, um, because she might blow up your own creatures. But something to keep in mind is, even if she does transform, if you're under control of when she's transforming, you can do nine damage to your opponent that turn if they don't have anything. That's almost half their life, because this does damage to your opponent, too. Sometimes it can just end the game, because you just bolted them to the head and swung for six um, and potentially wipe their board in the process if that wasn't enough, or at least, you know, wiped a good amount of their board. So Archangel Avacyn, pretty crazy. By the way, interesting combo that does in fact exist is that because it, you're never going to get two of these. If you do, you're, you're a bad person, I guess, because they're mythics. But once Avacyn flips to Avacyn the Purifier in response to that, you can flash in your second Archangel Avacyn because they're not, even though they're the same person, you know technically they're not the same named creature so that you can have both archangel avacyn and avacyn the purifier and play at the same time so you can flash in your second archangel avacyn when your first one's trigger goes on the stack to do three damage to everything and save all your creatures so you know i mean that's never going to happen but <laughs> the fact is alone even if you only have one archangel avacyn she's going to be an incredible card a very powerful card at any stage of the game she'll completely change the game in your favor and that's what makes her the best uh, rare or mythic in shadows of innistrad limited that's my list um let me know what you think of it in the comments if there's a card you think i left out a card you think i overrated let me know um and don't forget to like the video that helps you know get the video seen by more people which motivates me to make more content um so yeah uh this is 